everyone. Welcome to the March 22nd work session of the Ann Arbor City Council, where today we'll be regaled with another fiscal year 22-23 budget presentation, this time by the good people at the Downtown Development Authority and the Smart Zone. Mr. Crawford, you have the con. Thank you, Mayor. Tonight, the first presentation is going to be by the DDA. We have with us the Executive Director, Moore Thompson, to kick it off, along with some other staff. Excellent. Okay, thank you. I was in that um, weird um, no man's land space for a minute. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. Uh, slideshow. Okay, and I'll also, um, stop my video because sometimes I have problems. Okay, thank you for your patience, everybody. Um, thank you, Mr. Crawford, uh, Mayor Taylor, council members. Uh, I'm Mara Thompson. I am the interim director and communications manager at the DDA. And I am joined here tonight uh, by with my colleague, Sarah McCollum, who is our deputy director and accounting director. So as you have seen in all of the budget presentations thus far, the city has objectives and performance measures for all service areas. The DDA's objective is to support a vibrant downtown, with the measure being that property values within the downtown increase faster than the rest of the city. In the last five years, property values within the DDA have increased an average of 9.7%. So that's that um, green bar on the graph. Um, and the city average is represented um, on the blue line at 4.4%. So we are happy to report that we have been consistently meeting this objective. The DDA has two primary revenue sources. Parking fees, which support the operating and capital improvements activities in the parking system, and tax increment financing, better known as TIF, which supports the downtown development and affordable housing activities of the organization. Um, together, the activities of these two primary systems carry out the DDA's mission, which you can see there in orange, which is to undertake public improvements that have the greatest impact on strengthening downtown and encouraging private investment. So the parking system. The DDA manages the public parking system for the city of Ann Arbor. The system has about 8,000 spaces, which includes on-street, surface lots, and parking structures. Um, the DDA does not handle enforcement of on-street parking. We do not issue tickets. That is handled by the city's community standards unit, and the DDA does not share um, in that revenue. So the parking system pre-pandemic. Um, we feel very fortunate that the parking system entered the pandemic in a strong position in terms of fund balance and the condition of the facilities. We had a $13 million fund balance um, at the end of um, last June. Um, this fund balance had been built up over several years in the anticipation of a major capital project, the expansion of the Ann Ashley parking structure. Um, in hindsight, it was a blessing that council did not approve that expansion because we would have been in a much different position right now had that project moved forward. We also entered the pandemic with parking facilities very well maintained, thanks to strict ongoing adherence to a 20 year maintenance plan. DDA staff work closely with the parking operator and an engineering firm to ensure the upkeep of all components of the parking system. So the pandemic hits just about one year ago this time, um, and the impacts to the parking system were immediate. Uh, basically, the bottom fell out. Um, as you can see here in April, our hourly revenue um, in the structures was down 100%. Um, and as you may recall, Ann Arbor responded in the same manner that parking facilities around the country responded, and we raised gate arms while the stay-at-home order was in place to protect staff and the public. 
On street meter revenues were down 99% and monthly permit revenue began its much slower decline at 5% back in April and we have continued to see that number decline. Um, we immediately began developing revenue projections, followed quickly by expenditure reductions. Um, like the city, we were in the middle of our FY21 budget preparation, uh, and in step with the city, we moved forward with the pre-pandemic um, budget figures. This graph shows year over year off street meter revenues from March of 2020, so last March to this past January, from parking systems around the country. Um, and I, I show you this just to point out, you can see that the immediate impact, um, that big dip you see on the left, was almost identical from coast to coast. Um, so this is showing um, LA to Boston, Texas to Florida, parking systems crashed across the country um, at about the same time. The recovery is a bit more sporadic, uh, and this is most likely due to state by state response. But Ann Arbor lands right about in the middle of this graph at around 50% of pre-pandemic revenues as of this past January. This graph shows parking fees across the system by month. And by across the system, I mean on street, hourly, um, and monthly permits. So that yellow line shows our FY21 uh, budget. And you know, as a reminder, we, that was set at pre-pandemic levels. Uh, the gray bars are our um, FY20 actuals. And April through June is almost entirely made up of permit fees. Um, the green bars are our FY21 actuals. We are currently um, just under 48% of budget, and we are projected to come in at about 47% of budget by year end, which is um, June 30th. On the expenditure side, we made significant cuts in FY20 and FY21. Uh, last March, when all of this started, we immediately cut 39% of capital expenditures in that last quarter of FY20. Uh, fiscal year 21, we anticipate cutting 67% of expenditures. Uh, Republic Parking has cut 31% of personnel and 22% of other um, operations, things like the ongoing smaller maintenance items that they take care of um, on an ongoing basis. Um, for FY 22 and 23, the budget has been trimmed way back to reflect pandemic recovery responses. So clearly the parking system is suffering significant pandemic related impacts and the recovery is uncertain. The DDA's obligations, however, are very straightforward and we prioritize expenditures accordingly. Um, debt obligation. We know we are responsible for our debt and we will be making those payments. We also know that the city relies on 20% of parking revenue to support general fund activities, which in turn support our community. Um, I want to point out that if the recovery unfolds in a more positive way than we have projected, um, you will see us back here before you for a budget amendment. The city's 20% directly correlates to revenues, so if revenues come in higher, um, then we will need to amend our budget to be able to provide the city with its share. So, so basically, I'm just setting the stage that if you see us again, um, it's because we have good news. Um, we are also responsible for critical repairs. We must keep our facilities safe for the public. So things like staircases, elevators, cracks in concrete, we must maintain um, our system. And maintaining city parking facilities, extending the life of these important downtown assets is another top priority of the DDA. Uh, we must keep up with ongoing maintenance, things like waterproofing, sealants, and all sorts of other things that you don't think about um, to avoid major breakdowns and more um, expensive repairs in the future. The parking system also supported many of our um, COVID response efforts to support our downtown community. Um, and this support spans the DDA's um, FY 2021 and 22 budgets. 
Uh, the curbside carryout program, the uh, parking space repurposing program. Uh, we waived meter bags for both of these programs and also for street closures. And, and just as a rough estimate, um, that's about $1.1 million in um, meter fee waivers. Um, management of the meter bags. This is a, a shout out to Republic parking staff. Um, although they are operating very lean right now, they have still maintained a high level, high level of customer service, uh, being really responsive to meter bag changes um, and re uh, relocating meter bags for street closures, bagging for street closures. It's a very labor intensive process and they do um, a really great job. Um, we waived monthly penalties on past due permit accounts and we did a one time um, monthly permit fee waiver. Whoops, sorry about that. Um, so now I'll switch gears to talk about TIF, our tax increment financing. Um, through TIF, the DDA takes on major infrastructure projects. Again, going back to our mission of taking on public improvements to strengthen downtown, uh, at its core, the DDA is an infrastructure organization. We had better news on the TIF side. Revenues have not been impacted. However, we did not know the implications at this time last year. So as a precautionary measure, we delayed about $3.7 million in FY20 and 21 projects. Um, the majority of that being the State Street Improvement Project, which was scheduled to happen um, this, this construction season. Um, lessons learned from the pandemic have broadened the lens through which we look at our projects, and the pandemic has highlighted the critical link between infrastructure um, and resilience. DDA projects play a role in building a stronger community. And the DDA is guided by a development plan established back in 2003. The plan could not have anticipated a global pandemic. However, working toward a long-term vision and a more resilient downtown is simply inherent in this work. Um, a quote from the plan states, maintaining and investing in infrastructure is essential to downtown's ongoing stability and vitality. These words remain just as applicable today um, as they were back in 2003. The Rockefeller Center defines resilience as the capacity to prepare for disruptions, recover from shocks and stresses, and adapt and grow from a disruptive experience. The ability to use our streets in a flexible and adaptive way has been key to our COVID response here in Ann Arbor and around the world. We have used our streets for business operations to improve access and to provide space for social distancing. Streets are an asset, asset, and street design can help communities prepare for and deal with disruption. Over the last several years, the DDA has been underway with projects framed by our People Friendly Streets Initiative, which is all about improving access and making our streets safe and comfortable for all users. Um, this map shows a snapshot of those streets. So to orient you a little bit, um, the streets in green are our completed projects and those in purple are current. It started with the South University project back in 2018. That's that green line on the bottom right. Uh, we then moved to uh, Fifth in Detroit in 2018, the green X up there on the top. Um, and then on to the two parallel green lines in the middle, which represent um, Huron Street um, and the William Street Bikeway, both, both of which were um, completed in 2019. And currently, the purple lines, we are working on the First and Ashley Street project, which will wrap up this summer in the very beginning of our FY22 budget season. Within these projects, we are replacing essential infrastructure, but doing so in a way that has purpose and emphasizes sustainability, safe access, and creating more inviting civic spaces. You can see from this graph that for these four projects, the majority of the project costs are infrastructure related, followed by stormwater improvements uh, and streetlight replacement. We are currently underway with developing the next round of People Friendly Streets projects. I know some of you participated in our virtual public engagement workshops a couple of weeks ago. 
or maybe it was just last week, um, we had great dialogue with the community. Um, and we're continuing with that outreach, actually using paper surveys to try to reach members of the community we were not able to reach through our virtual engagement. People, excuse me, people friendly streets projects are value driven in the discussion of resilience and our experience at the start of the pandemic helped to shape these values. Uh, this past July, the DDA board adopted the value set you see on this slide. Uh, these drive these values drive planning and design in identifying and prioritizing projects and all also help us measure the success and impact of our projects. And these values also align with key city initiatives, building more affordable housing, carbon neutrality by 2030, and the 2025 Vision Zero Goal. Um, the pandemic has highlighted that we don't want to rebuild the status quo, we want to build better. People Friendly Streets prioritize access improvements for all users, whether you're walking, driving, taking the bus, biking or in a wheelchair. The goal is to ensure that our streets are safe and comfortable, no matter your age, your ability or your mode of transportation. People Friendly Streets projects also aim to help build resilient, flexible streets. The pandemic highlighted the importance of adapting streets, street closures, increasing space for people, reusing curbside space. We can make our infrastructure adaptable for events, business operations, people, and the environment. The DDA has also um, been working very closely with our partners at the Ann Arbor Housing Commission in their efforts on city-owned uh, properties in our downtown. We are coordinating the next round of people-friendly streets projects so that we can provide the Housing Commission with the infrastructure support they need, things like water main upsizing and stormwater improvements, while also meeting other DDA and city goals. So the, our projects for FY 22 and 23, um, like I said earlier, the first in Ashley Street project will um, wrap up this summer. Um, other projects on the horizon, the DDA board has committed $10 million for the next round of People Friendly Streets projects with over 7 million in the FY 22-23 budget. Um, the State Street Improvement Project, which is a partnership with City Engineering, um, is scheduled to um, get underway in 2022 construction season, so about this time next year. Um, the two projects, oh, oh, I'm sorry, and I missed the Division Street Bikeway, um, which is a project that initiated from one of our pilots last year, which we are planning to make um, permanent, hopefully this fall. Um, and the two projects listed in red are of particular importance as they are the projects that we are working on with our partners at the Housing Commission and the AAATA. Uh, Miller Catherine Street. We have an opportunity to support the Housing Commission's efforts on the 4th and Catherine parking lot. Also to make another connection in the protected bikeway network and address a tier one or high crash corridor noted in the city's transportation master plan. Um, this will likely occur in um, 2022 ahead of the Housing Commission's um, project on 4th and Catherine, but we, we stay in close connection with the Housing Commission um, to monitor the timing on that. Um, 4th Avenue Street and Transit Improvements. Um, this is another collaborative project. Not only are we working with the Housing Commission, but also the AAATA. Um, this, this project will support the Housing Commission's work at 350 South 5th, along with streetscape improvements to support transit operations at Blake and provide a safer and better experience for transit users, users on 4th Ave. Um, we have built capacity in our FY 22-23 budget for this project. However, the timing is yet to be determined um, and we continue working with our partners as this project takes shape.
TIF dollars have also funded much of our pandemic response in support of the downtown business community. Um, given the way this crisis has unfolded, the funding for this support spans the DDA's FY 20, 21, and now 22 budget. Uh, we provided $50,000 for barricades for the street closure program. Um, the DDA funded this emergency effort last year, and thanks to um, Council's approval of the street closures again this year, the DDA will provide that same level of support. Um, the DDA also funded all of the sidewalk occupancy permits for downtown businesses last year, um, and we will do so again this year. Um, we provided signage and posters and ads with public health messaging last year, and we are working with our colleagues in the city communications department this year on some more limited signage, um, thinking that most of us kind of know the drill by now, but we, we will get some signage up there. Um, other pandemic support out of TIF included distributing 500 boxes of PPE to the downtown community, landscaping and marketing support to the downtown associations. Uh, we installed pilot projects to provide more space for social distancing. We funded murals by four local artists um, and we installed a hand washing station on Main Street. The DDA also provides annual community support on an ongoing basis. Um, in FY 22 and 23, through the parking system, the DDA will provide its annual funding for the Go Pass and the Get Downtown program. Uh, we will continue to manage the bike parking that you see um, in the structures, the bike houses and the bike hoops and the lockers. Um, and in a typical year, we would waive over $300,000 in meter bag fees for nonprofits having events in our downtown. So um, Art Fair, Summerfest, Taste of Ann Arbor, the African American Festival, Dancing in the Streets, Kindle Fest, the list goes on and on. Um, so whenever it is safe for those types of events to occur, uh, we stand ready to to support. And finally, um, through our through TIF in FY 22 and 23, um, as we always do, we will be providing the city with over half a million dollars um, in support of debt on the Justice Center. Um, we will do $400,000 in sidewalk repair and maintenance. We will contribute $150,000 to the city's streetlight replacement program. Uh, we will transfer $330,000 into the DDA's affordable housing fund. Um, we will also provide about $100,000 to support the holiday lights you see in our downtown trees. Um, and finally, the DDA will be getting underway with a curbside management study in FY22. Um, curbside demand had, had already been shifting pre-pandemic with things like uh, rideshare apps and increased deliveries. We were already starting to see some changes. And with the pandemic, um, the competing needs for curbside space have increased and the trend of the change we were already seeing um, has just accelerated. So an RFP for that study, we are hoping to get out the door in the next couple of weeks um, and funding for that study will be split between our um, parking and our TIF funds. And now I am gonna hand it over to my colleague, Sarah McCullum. Thank you, Maura. Can everybody hear me? Yes, we can. Great. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, Sarah McCollum here, DDA Deputy Director and Accounting Director. Uh, we appreciate you taking the time to receive our budget presentation tonight. Um, and we're almost at the end. We just have two more slides to go through, uh, the ones with the budget numbers. Maura, if you could, can you go forward one? Oh, sorry about that. Mm -hmm. okay. Cool. So these may look familiar to some of you. Uh, they are in the same format as previous years and in the same format that is included in the city's budget document. This first one presents information organized by category and the next slide has the same information organized by fund. Both slides represent uh, revenues in the blue section at the top and expenditures in the or orange section on the bottom. And both present five columns of information actual activity for fiscal year 20, both the budget and projected actual for 21, and proposed budgets for 22 and 23. 
We'll spend most of our time on the next slide, the one that's organized by fund, but I did want to point out a couple of items on this one before we move on to that. So the first thing you might notice, if you glance at the total revenues for all categories, that first gray row below the, in the blue section, um, is that something's clearly up with the fiscal year 21 budget. Total revenues in that column are 6.2 or 62.6 6 million compared to approximately 30 million in the other columns. And there's a couple of different reasons for this. The first has to do with um, operating transfers in, which is the, the row that you'll see kind of in the middle of that revenue section, that fourth row down. Um, fiscal year 21 budget has $11 million in this line item. So that's over double what's in the other columns. The, the thing to know about this item is that it does not account for cash received. The way we typically think of revenue, it, it accounts for money that is shifted from one DDA fund to another DDA fund. So we have two funds that are primarily funded through these transfers. The housing fund, which is funded by transfers from the general TIF fund, and the parking capital improvement fund, which is funded by transfers from the parking fund. They don't have their own revenue streams. They are funded entirely by transfers in. Again, the important thing to know here is that this doesn't represent a bump in revenues. It's just shifting money from one pocket to the other. So the next item of interest is on the row just below that, prior year surplus. So that's the fifth row down. This is um, like another line item that does not represent cash in. This is a category that's established by the city's budget process to account for um, any spend down of fund balance. And you'll note that those numbers are only included in the budget columns, so not in the activity for fiscal year 20, not in the projected activity for fiscal year 21. So it's just something to keep in mind when you're comparing from column to column. The last item of note here is the final category in the revenue section, bond proceeds. The city issued bonds on behalf of the DDA in 2019, and it holds those funds and then reimburses us from the proceeds for our construction expenditures. So this is the revenue side of that, um, the bond proceeds. The construction period extends over three years. So this is a temporary category fund that will be closed in fiscal year 22. So that's why you see that fading out for fiscal year 23. Okay, and we can move on to that next slide then and take a look at the DDA's budget by fund. So the DDA, um, as Mara explained, has two main um, activity centers, but it has five funds. Two of those are accounted for in the authority's parking system, and the other two account for the downtown development, or the other three rather, account for the downtown development activities. So we're gonna start by talking about the parking system. Um, which is comprised of the parking fund, which is the parking operating fund, and the parking capital improvement fund. These funds are, par are funded by parking fees and transfers, one uh, from the parking fund to the CIP. And then the activities accounted for here are operations, administration, debt service, about 50% of our debt service is accounted for in the parking fund. The city 20% payment, um, some grants uh, primarily to the AAATA, and um, capital maintenance and improvements. So if we just kind of go, we're going to work our way left to right, uh, fiscal year 20 activity. The pandemic hit, as Maura mentioned, in the third, um, at the kind of the very tail end of the third quarter. We suffered a loss of about $5.7 million for that year. So that represents about 30% of our overall revenues for fiscal year 20. One of the changes we implement, implemented in response to that was to reduce transfers out to the CIP fund. That was minimized so we could retain that fund balance that we had in the operating fund, which is the fund that was affected by the loss of parking fees. So moving to the right to fiscal year 21 budget, of course, these are those pre-pandemic levels as was approved. Um, and for the parking fund, you see that $31 million number. That includes $6 million of prior year surplus. So that represents that spend down of fund balance. 
The remaining 25 million is primarily made up of parking fees. Um, in the, CI, the parking CIP fund, uh, for this year, you'll see 11.3 million, and that's that transfer from the parking fund. Again, all pre-pandemic numbers as budgeted um, for capital projects that were planned. Moving over then to fiscal year 21 projected, of course, we anticipate our actual activity for fiscal year 21 to be much reduced. In the parking fund, we're projecting 12.3 million in parking fees versus the 25 million that was budgeted. So, you know, that 47 to 49% of budget levels. And in the CIP fund, um, the transfer in is reduced as well, um, just like we did in fiscal year 20. We've cut that down to 4.7 million. So that's about a 58% reduction um, of that uh, budgeted 11.2 million. And then moving over to the left again for fiscal year 22 and 23, we are projecting parking revenues of 14.7 million. So that brings us up from that kind of 49% up to 58% of fiscal year 21 budget. And um, for fiscal year 23, we're bumping that up again to about 18 million or 72% of the fiscal year 21 budget numbers. Uh, and the, for the CIP fund, transfers in, we're planning about 2.6 million for both years, just enough to cover very minimal capital expenditure levels so that we can kind of maintain um, adequate fund level, uh, fund balance levels. Okay, expenditures, um, so we're moving down to the orange section now. Going back to fiscal year 20 activity at uh, the left side. So those cost cutting measures that uh, Maura mentioned were implemented immediately when the pandemic hit, um, putting a hold on all but the most critical capital maintenance items. Although we were already 75% um, through the year at that time, we were able to end the year with a slight increase to the overall parking system fund balance as we headed into 21. So as, as Maura mentioned, that fund balance at 630-20 was about 13 million. For fiscal year 21 budget, again, pre-pandemic numbers, uh, we had the parking fund at 31 million, including a $10.6 million transfer out to the CIP fund, which of course was reduced. The remaining uh, 20.4 million is made up of operational costs. The city's 20% debt service grants administration, again, all at pre-pandemic levels. Then moving over to projected, um, those numbers were reduced uh, to about 55% of budget to about the $17 million mark, pretty much in line with the revenue losses. Um, the reduction in what we transferred out to CIP, of course, represents the largest portion of this, reduced by 72% to that $4.7 million number, but other categories were reduced significantly as well. Even with these uh, comprehensive reductions, we do anticipate that fund balance will be spent down as much as $6 million in fiscal year 21. So this should be the year hardest hit by the effects of the pandemic. And as Maura mentioned, we were very fortunate to have a $13 million fund balance to help us write out this challenging time. So moving forward to 22 and 23, expenditures here are budgeted to allow us to maintain, again, those adequate fund balance levels in the parking system with continued reduced levels of operating and administration costs and minimum levels of capital maintenance, about 2.6 million for each year. I wanna emphasize here that those reduced levels of maintenance represent a deferment of cost rather than a reduction. The work's still necessary, it's just delayed to a later date. Because we entered the pandemic with the structures in good repair, this deferment is less uncomfortable than it would be otherwise but we still know that, um, you know, that work will have to be done in the future. Even with these reduced expenditure levels, some additional spend down of fund balance will be necessary. Um, fiscal year 22, the budget does anticipate an additional spend down of 2.8 million, a much smaller level than 21. So we're heading in the right direction. And in fiscal year 20, 
2023, that number is reduced yet again to just about 700,000. And then for fiscal years 24 and outlying years, our 10 year plan um, calls for a steady recovery and annual increases to fund balance as well as increased capital maintenance levels as that revenue recovery um, as it allows. So it bears noting um, here that parking fee projections are highly uncertain at this time. For that reason, our goal was to be conservative in our estimations, and I think we've achieved that. I mean, only time will tell, but uh, we will continue to monitor the revenues monthly and will adjust expenditure levels as needed with an eye on maintaining sufficient fund level balances for the overall system while prioritizing those most critical maintenance um, items in the structure. Structure. So now um, we're going to move forward to talking about uh, the downtown development system funds. And these are going to be um, a lot more straightforward <laughs> and, and simpler to get through. Almost there. Um, so this again, uh, downtown development is comprised of three funds. That's the general TIF fund, the housing fund, and the TIF construction fund, which accounts for those bond dollars. So um, th those funds are funded by tax increment financing or TIF dollars, transfers in the case of housing, and bond proceeds in the case of the construction fund. Activities are primarily capital construction, um, debt service, grants and uh, some administration, affordable housing, and um, again, capital construction with the bond dollars. So I'm gonna take a little bit different tact in how I go through these. Um, I think it'll be more helpful to review them by fund rather than going across the columns or, or years. So for the general TIF fund, revenues there have been very consistent uh, and they are planned to remain so through fiscal year 23. Any variations on that line item are due to planned spend downs of fund balance, um, to do capital projects. And it's on the expenditure side, it's the same thing. If you see variations, it's due to those capital projects being planned in that fund. <clears throat> the housing fund, city ordinance identifies the minimum annual transfer from TIF to housing, and we do that each year. In fiscal year 21, the DDA transferred a bit more in anticipation of the Lurie Terrace purchase and um, expenditures are budgeted just kind of to match those funding levels to give the DDA board the flexibility to consider any housing projects that may be presented, which we wish, wish to support. The last fund to discuss is the construction fund, and this one's really quick and easy. It's a temporary fund, it'll be closed in 22. And that brings us to the end of the presentation. Thank you, everyone. Excellent. Thank you very much. Are there, would you probably go with questions here? Yes, that'd be great. Councilmember Ramlali. Thank you, Mayor, and uh, thanks to the DDA staff for providing us with this information here tonight. Um, I got a couple questions and, and perhaps a policy issue as we talk about our budgets and how they commingle. Um, on page six, we talk about the permits and that they decline by 5% in that first month or two of the pandemic. Do we have any information on where it is a year later, 10 months later, um, what is the reduction with those holders of the monthly permits? Uh, we, we do have that information. I don't have it off the top of my head. Sarah, I don't know if you have it with you, but I can certainly, I can get that to you tomorrow to let you know where we are. Thanks, Maria. I think it's um, perhaps let all, all, all of us know um, those bond, um, you know, those bond covenants are, are dependent on those permit holders. Uh, and so uh, to know what, what kind of shape we are with, with those um 
And then on page eight, we talk about the 48% projection. Um, I know uh, when the sky was falling, we were all um, taking our best stabs at what, what to expect. And I thought at the time, discussions, there were like three pessimistic scenarios or three scenarios that uh, all showed a negative um, uh, result of, 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 of the budget. Where did we lie? Do we know if we were like one of the better cases, worst case in the middle of those early on three, three um, scenarios? Well, I know um, right in the beginning, we actually did three, six, and nine month scenarios. And at the time, it seemed like that's crazy. Why would you bother doing six and nine month scenarios? Um, I, and, and I know Sarah's projections have been remarkably close, but Sarah, do you happen to, I, again, I can get you this information. I don't have it right here. I, I don't know if you remember, Sarah, exactly what you projected. I have to look back. I think that we are probably closer to the worst, but not not all the way down to the very worst. Although it's, it's um, extended out longer than we ever anticipated initially. Um, and by the way, the permits question, uh, we're at about 55% right now. 55% uh, of where we were pre-pandemic? Yes. We've lost 45%? We have. Wow, that's, that's scary. Um, thank you on that quick turnaround. Um, I guess the, the other issue, uh, and, and thankfully we, we just by happenstance, we're able to um, come into this with a good fund balance. And I think that's what's helping many businesses and people and organizations throughout this pandemic is that we entered it after a 10 year um, um, bull economy. Uh, and so going into it with, in, in good shape. But my, my concern is, what happens when when something else happens as we, as we experience in capitalism, and and this wasn't brought on by, uh, you know, some of the other bust factors of capitalism, but in a year, two, three years, five years from now, uh, we may experience something as we've experienced many times before, and uh, just to keep ourselves uh, guarded to that fact, if we would. Uh, my other question is is really about the street maintenance and the the bike lanes adding more bike lanes. And when we talked uh, about our, our costs and maintenance uh, about a month ago, uh, staff has reported that we spent $277,000 uh, cleaning um, bike lanes. Um, does the DEA consider sharing these ongoing maintenance costs when they're adding in these infrastructure improvements? Um, that's not a discussion we have had with Public Works. You know, it, we. We haven't been approached on that. Okay, well, thanks. Uh, perhaps that's a conversation for a, a different day. I, I appreciate that and I'll follow up later on that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Council member Griswold. Yes, thank you for a very concise and formative presentation. Uh, you mentioned street lights a few times and, and most of you know that I've been talking about street lights for some time. Um, and you mentioned 11% funding on street lights. And uh, many of those lights are the very attractive pedestrian lights that are on the side of the road. Uh, the question I have is um, when we're replacing the traditional street lights with the pedestrian lights, um, are we ensuring that we still have adequate positive contrast lighting at all of our crosswalks? And I don't necessarily need an answer right now, but it's something that um, that's a question that's been raised to me. Um, another issue is that we've adopted Vision Zero, and I did sit in on some of the uh, People Friendly Streets uh, presentation. And I'm wondering if we're looking at the areas with the highest crash incidents. Mm -hmm. And one of the one of the uh, um, solutions is to create hard left turns, so you uh, build out an, um, a median so that a person cannot take a left hand turn at the forty miles an hour that we're seeing downtown in some cases now. And so I'm wondering if if that's being considered. 
Um, thank you for those questions. Um, Councilmember Griswold, I can tell you that on the streetlight replacements, um, the work we do within our projects and the um, collaboration we have with the city where we just contribute to this streetlight um, fund, replacement fund, um, we work directly with city engineering to make sure that we are complying with um, all of the standards for safety. Um, and then um, as far as our streets, the um, Miller and Catherine Street project, and I believe Division Street, have both been called out in the um, transportation master plan as tier one, you know, higher crash areas. Um, and I think you are referring to bump outs um, to help with those left hand turns. And we do install bump outs in many of our projects. I don't know, we, we're not at that stage yet um, on upcoming projects, Division or Miller Catherine for me to give you those specifics, but I can tell you that you're absolutely right. Um, th th that is something that we always consider and um, install when possible. Okay, and I really appreciate the bump outs that I'm seeing around town. This is actually more of a little median that goes out beyond the crosswalk, but we, we can talk oh, about mm -hmm. it another time. And uh, my last question is, uh, is the DDA able to monitor street light outages? I know that we use A2 Fix It and it works quite well in residential areas because people, uh, Think of a street light as sort of being their own and so they report it and in the DDA area that's not the case and I, I know that the city and the DDA have been working on this and I'm just wondering what the status is of trying to maintain uh, the street lights in a working condition. Yeah, um, Mr. Crawford and I have had discussions about this and um, I in turn um, passed on that information to the area associations who I know went directly to businesses um, as well as Republic Parking. So we have Republic Parking staff making sure um, that if they see an outage, they report it. Um, and, and I can tell you that um, for two particular business owners, um, I know they have been now reporting since we asked them to, um, and, and we ha we've had some repairs done. So um, I think it's an effort we can continue working on, um, but I, I think even just a little bit of communication went a long way. Okay, that's really great news. Thank you. Council Member Hainer. Oh, thanks, Mr. Mayor, and thanks for the presentation. A um, couple, couple things real quick. Uh, one, I promised next time I got in front of the DDA, I promised some uh, business uh, partners and, and other uh, friends of mine that I mentioned this, that they all feel strongly that our parking app should be more like the Detroit parking app, which notifies you when your meter's about to expire. So when their meeting's going late, they can re-up their meter. They feel that the Detroit parking app and system is much more progressive and they keep asking me to say something publicly. So okay. I just want to throw that out there. I don't use the app myself, but um, you mentioned a, you said that um, the critic, you mentioned the critical link between uh, infrastructure and resilience. And I, I was taking some notes, I was writing some stuff down and I wondered if you could tell me, it could redefine it for me. What what did we find to be the critical link between infrastructure and resilience? That's my first question. Well, I mean, a few things. I think um, you know our our ability to provide additional space for people helped us be more resilient. Our um, our um, our, our ability to provide space for business operations. Um, I know from you mean help the city be more resilient, or the DDA, uh, the, or our the downtown. Community the community oh, okay. as a community and then there are things like you know when you're thinking about other crisis right like not just public health but maybe it's climate related so we know that um, a lot of the work that we do like with stormwater work in our projects um, can also help build resilience you know when it comes to things like if there's a flood or you know other climate related things so i think through our infrastructure there are um you know many things that can help our community be stronger yeah i, I think it's important that um these sort of goals like a to zero goals is an example which you had on the slide that they are integrated fully through our and you know vertically if that's the expression through our all city concerns so whenever you guys are doing a project obviously it has to exceed our stormwater standards and all those things and be as green as possible and so on so th thanks for that um you know so um people have asked me so what is the dda's mission i sent them to the thing i tell them about that and you know this remaking of the streets and the reconfiguring of the streets has you know obviously it's a very visible projects and so um 
I've had folks ask me and they express a lot of interest in uh, other things that are going on downtown, like how can they be part of this uh, fiber installation project that's going on in the downtown area? Uh, this war one, two, threes digging up the, you know, and, and I know they got to be back at some point to, to pour that concrete in these sidewalks because they've really been tearing it up down there. But um, can, is, can you refer me to a place where business owners and people who live downtown and work downtown can, who should they talk to if they want to be part of these kinds of projects? They want access to that fiber project. They want access to, you know, grant writing assistance or to make suggestions for the DDA and how, how they, they feel what they'd like to see you to do. Who should they talk to? Um, well, I mean, I guess I would say as far as like the 123.net and all that fiber work we see downtown, um, we see it too. And sometimes it happens um, in areas that we have literally just reconstructed. So that that isn't something that the DDA is is in, involved with. Um, what, what is that project? I thought that we were doing a expanding of fiber opportunities through oh. the community. Maura, I might be able to. Uh, yeah, help. could you? Um, uh, Councilman Hanner, the uh, the work you see now is actually uh, private work, private work being done for uh, private purposes. The project you're referring to um, is uh, we're planning to start construction uh, later this year. And, uh, so, so, and anyone who would like to have involvement with that, as far as you know, getting access or things like that, uh, can reach out to uh, Mr. Shuchuk, Tom Shuchuk. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Thanks. Because I've had people say, you can use my building if you want to relay wireless or whatever. They want to really grow this sort of, um, uh, you know, communication infrastructure in our downtown area. And mm -hmm. I thought, I, I thought that's maybe that what was happening before our very eyes. So, okay, I'll, I'll write down the rest of my stuff so others have chance. So thank you for answering. I, ideally, I, I'll just point out, ideally, with uh, the construction of the city's network, maybe you'll see less of that because we'll have capacity for other people to use, use ours. Thank you. Council Member Song. So since this is a budget work session, I'll ask a budget related question. Um, so Mara, can you can you uh, clarify for me? Is it is it correct? Is my understanding correct that um, our debt service is paid from TIF and not revenue, not permit revenue? And that even with the pandemic, um, that was our, I mean, our TIF renew is fine and will increase over time. Yeah, our, so our, our um, debt service um, for our parking construction is mainly comes out of our parking fund, um, but we do carry some of that in our TIF fund as well. Um, for example, the library lane um, parking structure, because that was built to support development on top, that debt is split. I don't have the ratio off the top of my head, but it's split between um, TIF and parking. Um, and yeah, the, the projections um, right now, um, we don't anticipating um, having any reductions in TIF. You know, we're capped at 3.5%. Um, a year, so we, we can go up incrementally and we don't anticipate um, any reductions. Great, well, thanks. I hope you can keep uh, raking in the awards for the, for the work with the bike lane and um, keeping folks safe and envisioning a more vibrant downtown, so thanks. Staff member, I'm live. Thank you for the second opportunity. Uh, I just have a question about our credit card fees, and it's been, you know, bothering me for the two, three times um, I've gone through the budget process and heard about the fees that are associated. Uh, are we renewing that contract anytime soon? Is there anything that's changed? Um, but the fees associated with running that, I think, are above average. Yeah, I, I I I have to get back to you on that. I'll have to check with our parking systems manager. I I don't I don't know of any changes being made. I don't know about that either, about timing wise. But um, do keep in mind that wherever you see credit card fees, it also includes software. So we're it's not um, just a matter of swiping a card for a, a transaction. We have um, software at the meters that we also pay through that line item. It's all kind of combined through one vendor. The other thing to keep in mind is that um, our, our transactions tend to be small and numerous. 
which means we incur higher percentages of fees than would be normal for most retail establishments. And I think our levels are at about 5% overall, including the software costs right now. So they're, um, you know, higher than we'd like to see them always, but um, I, I don't think they're out of line with industry standards. Well, um, that, thanks for that information. If it's all at all possible, I'll, I'll be bringing this up again and submit it in writing as well, but to shop that around, uh, again, I feel like it, we, we, we can probably save some money there. Thank you. Any other questions? Thanks to the good people to DDA. Thank you all for your time. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Dr. Rakiner, uh, as we- Well, you know what, I, I'm gonna email it to Tom. It's a procedural question about how a budget is formed. Fair thank enough. you. I, I, I put my hand up quite late. You were correct. There were no raised hands. Oh, thank you. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Aaron, uh, would you like me to introduce the next group? Mr. Crawford. Uh, tonight, Council, we have a presentation on the Ann Arbor Ypsilanti Smart Zone. Uh, uh, Dr. Rapundolo <laughs> will kick us off, and with him, we have a um, representative from Spark, uh, Bill Mayer. Well, good evening, uh, everybody, Mr. Mayor, Council members. Thank you for the uh, opportunity to uh, talk to you tonight about the uh, Local Development Financing Authority, otherwise known as the Ann Arbor Ypsilanti Smart Zone. Um, I'm. Uh, I think if I'm if I'm correct, the last time we were before uh, this body was um, two years ago, and so uh, certainly there have been changes around the council table. Um, and so uh, recognizing that, what I wanted to do was to give a little bit of a backgrounder um, about the smart zones. It's typically not um, as well known um, of, in terms of TIFs, TIF in, increment financing authorities as is the DDA. Um, and I think it has some, um, some interesting, um, uh, there's some aspects of it that, that uh, require I think uh, a little understanding as to how this all works. So uh, I'm just gonna share my screen. Okay. Um, so uh, the smart zones, uh, I think there are little, 21 of them now. Um, back when uh, this was created in 2000, I think there was only about eight or nine formed of which Ann Arbor was one and I'll, and I'll uh, dive into the details here in a sec. Uh, but basically over time, over the last 20 years, um, the number of smart zones has uh, basically doubled. Um, and in many, in many cases, it also includes um, so-called satellite uh, zones that are affiliated with some of the larger and more established uh, smart zones. And we'll highlight that towards the end of my uh, presentation. Um, I think it's important to know that the LDFA, sort of like the DDA, there, there are some enabling um, legislation and governing um, documents um, that uh, govern, you know, how we operate, everything from obviously the, the enabling legislation, but then agreements between Ann Arbor and Ypsilanti creating the LDFAs. We have a development and a TIF plan with the state of Michigan and the MEDC in particular um, that governs what the TIF boundaries are, the tax capture, um, what can um, what the monies can be used for or not. Um, and then the body itself, of course, is governed by um, the bylaws. And I only mention all of this because, in fact, over the years, um, a number of these entreaties in have actually been invoked um, with specific uh, implications for, for budget allocations or budget requests um, that we have had to, um, uh, you know, uh, decline um, or uh, because they did not match um, or were not in line with um, a number of the uh, governing um, regulations. So in terms of Ann Arbor, um, we received status back in 01, but it took till about 2003 uh, for the uh, smart zone to 
operationally get off uh, the ground. And I think it's important to note that um, the, the state funds uh, are distributed uh, locally. Um, in other words, this is a tax capture um, within the boundaries that are identical to the, those of the DDA. Um, and uh, in the case of the smart zone, they're only captured in the Ann Arbor side. No, no capture occurs in Ypsilanti. Um, and that, that those funds can only be used exclusively in the Ann Arbor Ypsilanti service areas. Um, and so uh, to be clear, the smart zone is funded by the state of Michigan and without the smart zone monies, um, these would not otherwise be uh, distributed or received locally. Um, and in, in addition, and I'll talk about, I'll, I'll detail what the uh, purposes of the funds are for, but they can only be used for the, the purposes as defined by the regulating um, documents. Um, and they cannot be used for other uh, local purposes or programs or, or budget lines in the, in the municipal budget. And I'll, um, uh, my next comment bears repeating because um, there's been um, misinformation that has come up time and time again over the years. Um, and while I want to make clear that while the tax capture comes from taxes um, committed to schools, they are by law, I repeat, by law, repay, repaid to the local school districts by the state of Michigan. So the Ann Arbor Public Schools, for example, uh, funding remains whole. Um, and so basically how this all operates is the, the state uh, has a formula. Um, that it uh, applies to the uh, tax increment value increase within the district. And then essentially um, those funds are what is distributed to the smart zone to be deployed. Um, and so um, the smart zone over the years, um, I think a few years into its life, contracted uh, with Ann Arbor Spark and in fact its precursor um, for to to provide the services um, that um, uh, essentially would go towards um, assisting and catalyzing company formation um, and commercialization of high tech uh, technologies and products, um, and specifically those are applied in uh, business accelerator services to the companies. Um, this is, uh, comes in the form of incubator space where uh, we're talking um, at 330 East Liberty. There's, there's um, space for about 25 tenants. There's additional space on the top level for more um, uh, later stage companies, but the, who are not yet ready for prime time or market rate um, um, you know, conditions. Um, so in essence, these, the incubator is provides subsidized um, short-term leases. There's general administrative and common um, services that are provided. There's meeting space. Um, and then a smaller uh, facility similar in, in uh, purpose is um, located in Ypsilanti on, on Michigan Ave. Uh, in addition, um, the, we contract with Spark to manage the accounting of all of the um, LDFA services, uh, as well as to manage marketing as it pertains only uh, to support the LDFA funded programs. So uh, our dollars do not go towards uh, other aspects of Spark's uh, mission in terms of economic development um, or so on branding the, the uh, area and things like that. Um, just to do a little bit deeper, deeper dive in terms of the um, business accelerator services. So essentially these are services that are provided to everybody who's contemplating uh, forming a company um, to those that um, who are you know, growing and, and commercializing uh, technologies and products um, to a, a logical um, uh, exit or a sale or an acquisition by, by somebody. Um, and so obviously there's various stages uh, that takes time, um, but uh, you know, so we um, have offered over the years various so-called phases of accelerator services. 
Um, you, it begins with a, with a general intake. Many times the company hasn't even legally formed. Um, you know, their business plans, if they have one, or their concepts are reviewed and, and, and you know, consulted. Um, as uh, then they proceed to a phase two where there's a more in-depth evaluation uh, that's conducted to determine um, the capability of the, of the business for, uh, to, to execute um, on its milestones and what it thinks it can do. Um, and phase three, which is really the, um, the, the main um, set of services that are provided to companies. Um, here, you know, companies, we're, we're trying to help them with some, um, uh, you know, business operations, if you will. It can be uh, supporting um, costs related to intellectual property protection, to, uh, in the case of um, life science companies, it could be regulatory um, consults, things like that. In addition, um, the uh, SPARC, um, through its programs, uh, provides various education. You know, at the very, very early stage, you know, prior to phase one or at phase one, it's, it's an entrepreneur's boot camp. Many of, um, you know, founders don't have a clue as to how to start and build a company. Um, there are many business networking events across many technology and industry areas. Um, and so forth. In addition, dollars are spent to um, support uh, so-called executives and residents. So these are entrepreneurs, serial entrepreneurs who've been there, done that, um, who are now uh, in a position to um, teach others, um, which uh, not only benefits the company um, in question who seeks that kind of um, support and expertise, but it also uh, allows these executives, these serial entrepreneurs to stay in the community, uh, retain that C-level um, expertise, uh, which is really, quite frankly, hard to come by. Um, and, um, and they can do their magic all over again. Um, in, I don't know how many in the last number of years, um, dollars have been allocated towards uh, talent and workforce, primarily in the form of intern uh, internships and matching funds for internships, uh, as well as for digital um, uh, engagement clinic, um, where we're assisting companies um, in their digital marketing um, efforts. Um, other initiatives that uh, the dollars that go support are, um, I think, hopefully things that you've heard about, perhaps participated, um, the Mobility in the Smart Cities Initiative, um, if you, hopefully some of you have had the opportunity to participate in A2 Tech 360, which has grown tremendously over the last number of years and really uh, shines uh, um, a spotlight on the local um, technology sort of um, ecosystem, um, which has um, perhaps hides somewhat in the background on a daily basis, but is uh, this, this um, event really brings, brings it out to the forefront. Um, and really um, uh, reveals how, how robust uh, and broad it is um, in, in Ann Arbor. And then uh, also we have uh, linkages with um, Adrian Tecumseh Smart Zone, which is a satellite, now a satellite relationship with Ann Arbor um, Spark. So just a little bit in terms of some metrics and stuff. So over the last five years, um, if one was to take um, the so-called business accelerator service, uh, the funds allocated to business accelerator services, particularly the, the phase three, uh, along with the talent uh, allocations, that represents about 6.15 million. Um, and if one does the math, it works out that um, we're leveraging about $127 um, for every dollar uh, uh, spent. Uh, and that's not counting uh, acquisitions. So if a company was purchased uh, for X number of dollars, uh, we're not counting those, but just the direct uh, allocation of the LDFA dollars, uh, as I described, is returning 127 for each dollar. Pretty impressive. Um, over that period of time, um, the LDFA uh, via Spark has worked uh, with 428 companies. 
They represent about 2,000 tech sector jobs, which has been about an increase uh, of 1,000 FTEs um, over what, um, what was there to begin with. Uh, this gives you uh, a flavor for um, companies served uh, year over year. Um, so there certainly has been um, a good appetite um, for the services. Um, even during the pandemic, uh, that really didn't, um, didn't slow things down too much. Um, and this next slide um, kind of gives you a flavor um, for uh, the ability of the dollars that are being spent to translate into uh, company retention. Um, so you can see that um, a little over half of the companies uh, that have been served uh, continue to reside within the city of Ann Arbor. 6% uh, are over in Ypsilanti. Um, now, um, you know, this is uh, a risky, um, a, a, a risky, uh, well, literally business uh, industry to be in. Um, and so it's not uncommon to see, you know, the 15, 20% or more of businesses not survive over a period of five years. And then lastly, um, there's about an 18% of the companies that have been served um, who started out within the service area, uh, but in fact have now moved um, outside. Uh, many still in the Ann Arbor area, but just not in the uh, boundaries of the TIF and the, and the, um, and the TIF service area. Uh, this gives you a sense of um, how much money these companies raised in fiscal year 20. Um, so, you know, a little over 150 million uh, was raised through venture capital. Um, and then all the other associated um, sources of funding. Um, and, you know, this is held as a barometer across the country. Um, everybody, you know, the, the big hubs, uh, the more you can raise, um, you know, people wave the flag and it's, a, um, it's an indicator uh, of how well uh, an entrepreneurial ecosystem um, is, is thriving. Um, and obviously this ebbs and flows, uh, depending on markets and technology areas and so forth and so on. Um, and so this is an important um, metric by which um, uh, certainly companies look at uh, localities, uh, whether it's because that's where they want to uh, start or expand uh, businesses. And so this is an important metric that uh, the LDFA tracks. Um, Let's see. I hit a little ahead of myself here. Okay. Um, so fiscal year, some fiscal year 2020 um, metrics. So 148 companies received uh, those services. Um, it's translated into um, uh, about 138 new jobs. Um, 23 of those companies utilized the boot camp. Um, 95 were, were tenants uh, at the downtown um, incubator. Um, and there was about almost 100 educational programs and events hosted. Um, so, uh, you know, pretty engaged um, type of community. Um, some of, just gives you a couple examples of success stories. Um, two companies, Mabability and Ad Adapted. Um, you know, have been very successful, but they all, both of them started um, in the early stages of uh, receiving services from, um, from the LDFA through Spark um, and have gone on to not only raise um, a lot of uh, venture capital um, and have grown um, their businesses and uh, workforce um, and have stayed around here where those um, incomes and revenues have been deployed um, into the local economy. Just wanted to touch on specifically what um, the um, uh, allowable activities are within the smart zone. I've talked a little bit about the um, accelerator services and things like that, um, but um, they go towards things like entrepreneurial training, like I said, the boot camp, um, the executive management and coaching, mentoring and coaching. 
uh, assistance with writing uh, grants for federal support, like the Small Business Innovation Research Grants, which are a, a big uh, way that uh, many companies um, launch their uh, or conduct their proof of concept and, and take their first steps into commercialization. Um, it goes towards incubator and wet lab and accelerator um, you know, spaces and shared services, things like that. It can also be used um, uh, for the creation of technology parks, uh, so long as they're inside the smart uh, zone. Um, and a good example of, of unfortunately, where that um, doesn't apply, but we wish it did. Um, I don't know how many of you are aware of the, um, it's called MI-HQ, MIHQ, which is a, uh, took the old Paul Gelman um, site and repurpose it as a life sciences uh, incubator. And I forget how many companies are housed there, uh, but it is full. Uh, but unfortunately, it literally is um, on the opposite side of the, of the boundary. Um, and so the LDFA dollars, while it supports this kind of activity, uh, cannot in fact be deployed there. Um, so, um, uh, some strict rules. All right, let's dive into some, um, some numbers. So this gives you a uh, sense of the trajectory of the TIF capture uh, since the inception of the smart zone. Obviously, um, there you know, was a dramatic uptick uh, almost 10 years ago. Um, and we have built um, the this, this set of services rather deliberately and systematically as revenue has, has permitted. Um, um, <laughs> I, I, I suppose I have the dubious honor of, I believe, being the longest serving member of the, um, of the LDFA board, mostly because of my tenure on, on, on city council. But what it offered me was the ability to be there, I think I joined in 05, uh, to watch um, this nascent uh, idea uh, being the smart zone um, really grow um, to to being uh, I think the gold standard in the state and its in its ability to uh, support um, company formation and entrepreneurship um, and and uh, as a result of that uh, become uh, a, a quite a economic driver um, in the high tech uh, space here uh, locally. Okay, moving a little bit more to the budget side, um, this kind of begins to give you a flavor uh, of what the kind of dollars that we're talking about. So um, we're uh, at the moment of fiscal year 21, um, we're targeting 4.6 uh, million. Um, we uh, receive a few pennies back on um, a prior uh, activity, which was microloans. So we would make small, $10,000, $20,000, $50,000 um, loans to companies. Um, and um, um, they, of course, the intent is that these companies would pay us back. Um, and so those dollars that are shown there are, in fact, those that have done so. Um, and um, so, uh, and then we do get some investment income uh, from uh, the money earned off of fund balance. Um, so there you have the sort of the total revenues that, that we get to work with. The next thing is, uh, is basically the budget um, that you get to see every year. Uh, we will be coming to you um, with the, the next one here. I think we're gonna be approving ours, at, if not this meeting, then the meeting in April. But this uh, kind of breaks out to um, level of specificity. Um, how we're allocating funds for the different uh, activities. So at the top, you'll see, um, you know, there is some uh, fixed uh, staffing that we support. And then you see the breakouts for the various phases, um, but particularly phase three is really the one that consumes um, a large part of the funds. Um, as I mentioned, the microloan program, that does not exist um, anymore. Um, that was not permitted when the um, Smart Zone was reauthorized in 2018 for an additional 15-year period. Um, 
And then you see some of the entrepreneurial and education program line items, um, particularly uh, the dollars spent towards internship and talent training. Um, we've also broken out uh, what is being allocated uh, over to Ypsilanti. Uh, as I said, there is no tax capture in Ypsilanti. However, again, in the new 15-year uh, reauthorization, 10% uh, of overall um, uh, TIF capture is now has to be allocated over to Ypsilanti. And so these numbers reflect that, that uh, disbursement and, um, and use. And then lastly, um, there are um, Spark indirect services. And in the next slide, um, this reflects uh, some major strategic expenditures. Um, a couple of years ago, we decided to um, uh, ask for or solicit um, new ideas for services or, uh, or resources that the LDFA could um, uh, could uh, fund, and uh, we have set aside 400000 for that. Um, that is something that is uh, done on a peer-reviewed uh, basis um, with some um, specific criteria and, and scoring and so forth. Uh, but the biggest ticket item that um, I think that, that we're currently funding is the Tech Park Fiber Grant. Um, for years, we were unable. We didn't have the tax capture to support something like this. And certainly, um, and we accumulated a fund balance though, um, and, um, and now are in a position where uh, that fund balance is being uh, dedicated uh, towards a very big capital improvement um, project. And then lastly, what you see here is the indirect services that the LDFA pays the city of Ann Arbor um, for its support, both legal and admin and, um, and so forth. Uh, and then at the bottom, you see um, the fund balance um, that uh, largely quite, uh, will, will be uh, utilized um, um, due to the Tech Park uh, Fiber Grant over the next year or two. Um, this is who serves on the board uh, currently um, by, um, by regulation. Um, uh, it's made up of nine members, um, and um, this is five from the city of Ann Arbor, two from Ypsilanti, one to represent um, the Washtenaw County, and one to represent um, the Washtenaw Community College. That is um, uh, from the uh, enabling legislation. And so these are uh, the members. I should point out that Andy Labar, we're seeing a, we're seeing a switch there in representation, Andy, um, Andy's term is, is um, ending and Jason Morgan will be joining us um, at the next uh, meeting. And then uh, we have representatives from both the cities. Uh, Bill Mayer, who's on this call, um, serves uh, ex officio. And then we have a representative from the Michigan, Michigan Economic Development Corporation, who of course is the source uh, of the funding um, and in, in reality um, uh, sits as the arbiter uh, for what can and cannot um, cannot be done with the funds um, that we receive. Uh, this just gives you a, a flavor about, I want to say, three, four years ago now, um, the LDFA um, conducted its first ever sort of strategic um, plan and um, highlighted or identified various areas um, that it wanted to, uh, to focus. Um, those indicated in red are the ones I think that were of higher priority and interests. Um, and you'll note in the second column under high tech company friendly infrastructure, uh, the very first bullet um, assist in the establishment of reliable fiber. And as, and as, uh, as I indicated, we've been able to, um, to take funds and, and uh, apply them in that regard. And so I think as we, uh, as the TIF, TIF capture grows, um, you know, we're going to be carefully trying to um, determine uh, where funds can best be deployed uh, to address some of these priorities that, um, uh, you know, are in sync, I think, in some respects with what the city of Ann Arbor is trying to, and the city of Ypsilanti are, are trying to do for the longer term. 
And I think that's, uh, that concludes my presentation. Excellent, and thank you. Are there any questions from council? Member Umlaoui. Uh, thank you, uh, Mayor. I um, just wanted to say, um, I appreciate Dr. Rapondolo's presentation and, and, and time uh, on the board. Um, and just wanted to say hi and, and thank you pretty much. And <laughs> see you on Thursday. See you on Thursday. <laughs> House Member Griswold. I also want to say hello. Um, and could you elaborate on the fiber project? I see you've got $6 million committed over the next three years. And uh, what, what is the extent of the area where we're getting fiber? Well, I'm going to defer to, uh, to Tom on that one. Um, he was, years ago, uh, he, he really was the, the catalyst um, for this. Um, and when, you know, finally, like I said, once we had um, at least enough money to kind of begin to put a down payment on this, um, we, um, we did so. But Tom really has been the the brainchild behind this. So Tom? Um, if I could just clarify, the, uh, it does look like six million, but actually uh, the one and a half million is, um, is a double counter when you do that. So it's, it's four and a half million is in the budget. That is, um, uh, would cover uh, an underground uh, fiber network throughout the DDA that would be accessible to each of the facilities. It does not go to the uh, university just the uh, private properties. That the structure is, is designed to be uh, flexible so that uh, it would enable uh, connections by uh, parties uh, very easily. So you, you can imagine that um, whether it's a sensor or things, whatever they would use in a smart city, um, it would be uh, pretty easily implemented. And it's in, in an effort to support an innovation zone te mm -hmm. type te uh, technology. So. Okay, great, thanks. Council member Briggs. Uh, thanks. Um, mine is uh, fairly similar to uh, Council member Griswold's question, um, just to expand a little bit on that. So since um, this last year has shown us how much uh, there's been a, a return to working at home um, and some companies may be beginning to think about doing that more and more, um, is there, consideration of of how we might be able to expand upon the innovation zone and, and move fiber throughout our community and then the second question well i'll go after i have one more question uh and to clarify on that uh the infrastructure that the city is putting in is open to other parties to use um so, so it's intended to reduce the amount of digging that is occurring um but also utilize the space and, and the assets mo most effectively um, so within that zone, uh, you know, people could talk to, to Mr. Suchuk and we could we could go from there. You know, the funding for um, uh, for from the LDFA for this type of thing has reached its maximum potential uh, with the restrictions that the LDFA funds has. We have had some conversations with the public schools about uh, connecting uh, their facilities. The city has, in addition to this, a ring in the city, if you think about it kind of conceptually, and that ring was designed to, to be near schools. Um, and you can imagine that uh, that, that might be an, an opportunity for uh, further development in the future, but we don't have any plans at this time. Yeah, I was gonna add, you know, that's, that's the rub is that while there are certainly things, whether it be capital infrastructure or services, that we would dearly love to deploy uh, beyond the actual TIP district, we're hampered by not being able to, to do so. And certainly even the fiber project is a good example, you know, linking Ann Arbor, well, even extending it to beyond the TIP district within Ann Arbor, much less extending it and connecting the two parts of the smart zone, i.e. Ann Arbor to Ypsilanti, is, is very problematic. We, we um, certainly tried. <laughs> Um, uh, but uh, we're not uh, successful in convincing the powers to be in Lansing that um, that, that was something that uh, LDFA dollars were eligible for. So, 
And the initial build of this is designed to be what they call an institutional network. So it's government uh, um, type and related entities. That's the primary focus, but it was designed to be a community asset. Um, and as uh, uh, Raponello was referring to, uh, the city is pursuing uh, Grant and Spark, I should say, uh, in, in partnership with them and, and others are pursuing an a, a EDA grant at this time to see if we can connect the Ann Arbor facility uh, to, and to Ypsilanti so that we can build that out. And then maybe even to ACM, the Senate, American Center for Mobility. Um, if, if that happens, uh, if that grant is awarded, that would be, I think that it comes back to, to, to council um, uh, because we'd be administering uh, the build of that grant and it would be an asset that, that, that we would have to help kind of regionally, but really connect the technology corridor. That's great. Um, and exciting to see this moving forward. Um, so the other question I had was, uh, you mentioned that venture capital is um, kind of a, a metric that's used to, to determine success. And so I was just wondering how um, the uh, venture capital investments we've seen, is that um, what the, is there a national benchmark or how does that compare to um, other successful um, zones, yeah. whether it's in the state or in other parts of the country? Well, I'll turn to that one over to Bill. Bill has a much better sense. We, you know, he Spark has certainly benchmarked other regions, um, uh, and certainly with regards to venture capital, but other metrics too. Bill, sure. Um, and hello, everyone. Uh, Bill Mayer. So, um, and you know, looking at Ann Arbor as being Ann Arbor, it's sometimes hard to benchmark against other communities. Um, you know, we. We try to avoid doing direct comparisons to uh, San Francisco or Boston just because of the difference in scale. But when you look at Ann Arbor, um, we like to say that we sort of um, use the term punch above our weight uh, for the capital raised. And by capital raised, what we refer to is at the earliest stage, the SBIR funding for uh, fundamental scientific research, as well as angel investment, uh, venture investments. Um, but we don't include things like uh, founder capital and uh, business plan winnings, things like that. So, you know, the Midwest has, has, has underperformed the coasts historically, but we've seen that really uh, pick up in the last five to 10 years. And it's picked up in two ways. Number one, sheer volume of capital and having coastal investors being comfortable investing in Midwest businesses, as well as what used to be a problem maybe 15 years ago, where uh, a company would get venture investment and then leave the area, we've seen the venture investors uh, be being comfortable leaving investments in place. And so when you look at a number like that, you, you need to understand that there are large deals inside of there, but there are also a lot of smaller deals. And so one of the nice things about the Midwest is uh, our companies tend to do more with less. So, you know, someone raising $5 million in Michigan uh, as compared to one of the coasts, it, it tends to go go further. So, um, you know, that that's always historically been a metric we track because if a company is able to gain early traction, customers, growth, but then they can't access growth capital to take a company to a level that an exit is appropriate or that it really has a, you know, a major uh, economic impact on the community, that's a problem. And they will leave if they can't find that capital. So we've, we uh, haven't been observing that. We've been uh, seeing companies not only uh, commit to staying in Ann Arbor uh, post-funding event, but we've actually seen companies, uh, you may have seen KLA as an example that's building a headquarters up on Nixon Road uh, that are choosing to open locations here because of what Ann Arbor has to offer. So, I mean, I think we're, for Ann Arbor, we're very good. Um, when you start to try and compare us to other um, other communities, it can get a little problematic. But what Steve referenced in terms of our benchmarking report uh, that was just published, um, that tries uh, it, it gives it our best try to compare everything from capital raise to affordable housing to workforce issues uh, across the board. Did that answer your question? It did. Thank you. You are. My apologies. Councilmember Song. Hi, everyone. I feel like I 
This is a familiar conversation. Um, <laughs> we should have given this thing or two about that. No, no, no. I just, I hear whispers. So um, I, I was wondering, is there, um, you know, equity and inclusion is, 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 uh, is part of our strategic plan. Is in your, when you look at your budgeting, is that something, is that a um, part of your own strategic plan and, and, and how you've, I mean, it'd be interesting to to see where we can have um, more diverse entrepreneurs in town. When I look at other cities, how they focus, like specifically focus on upper, underrepresented communities and making sure they have access to capital. Um, is that is that somewhere in the plan? And if not, why not? Yeah, that, that's a great question. So we do have a member of our staff that is our, um, you know, uh, DEI lead. Her name is Ann Partington. Uh, she both runs our Spark East facility as well as the um, DEI initiatives at Spark. And, and a big part of uh, what we try and do is, um, you know, be a, be a supporting player in terms of engaging with other entities that are focused on DEI, whether that's, uh, you know, something through the university or, or regional groups. Uh, in Detroit or anywhere else, you know, we try to to sort of um, be involved on a very broad regional level with those initiatives. Um, we do track all of our companies, and uh, we try to, um, you know, for example, we just did. There's a grant that came up, and we just ran a report, and so you know, we identified that within the last five years, we have um, 187 startups that were founded by women CEOs, which we we're happy to see. Um, and so, you know, there, there's kind of two sides of it. There's number one, the idea of you have a better staff, a better workforce, better capabilities when you use DEI as, as, as a strategy embedded in your business. And number two, uh, it can drive business results. So, you know, we've seen people uh, enter markets and have opportunities. For example, you know, the auto industry has uh, some regulatory elements around its, uh, you know, sort of vendors and, and other, you know, business that they do because they have their own DEI goals. So we try to take the position of training, education, uh, referrals between organizations, and, you know, just making sure that it's part of the conversation. Uh, we do have to be careful because as Spark, we're open and inclusive. So the entrepreneurs that come to us, you know, we'll, we'll help them in every way we can. But we definitely uh, weave a message of the benefits of uh, DEI uh, when we're talking to our companies. Just as important as doing customer discovery and building a strong company culture, we really try and reinforce that message. And uh, Ann Partington, who, uh, who does all of our programming, well, not all of our programming, but is our lead in our programming, really does a nice job with that. At least in my personal opinion, it's a, it's an interesting space that's very much in motion. So it's been really uh, enjoyable to see how that's uh, gained so much traction in the last five or so years. Because we need to make up for the past ten years, fifteen years before that. So keep thank going you longer that. than that. Yes, yeah, absolutely. It's been a while. Great. Well, thank you. That's that's very helpful. Oh, it's a great question. I appreciate it. Further questions? Dr. Pundula, Mr. Mayor, thank you so much. Of course, thank you. We now come to public comment general time. Public comment general time is an opportunity for members of the public to speak to council and the community about matters of municipal interest. To speak at public comment general time, please enter the number on your screen. That is 877-853-5247. 877-853-5247. Once connected, please enter meeting ID 942-1273-2148. Once you're connected, please enter star nine, star nine to indicate that you wish to speak. Clerk will notify, well, you have, once you're connected, you will have three minutes in which to speak. Our clerk will notify you when 30 seconds are remaining and when your time has expired. When your time's expired, please conclude your remarks and cede the floor. Is there anyone who'd like to speak at public comment? Caller with the phone number ending in 965, do you have a comment? I do. Hi, this is Joe Spaulding. Um, I was approached once again by a reporter from a major paper last week asking for quotes about tired lies by members of council trying to chill my free speech with absurd distractions. 
going on the record with false claims about me because you don't think Ann Arbor should have to pull its weight on climate change and ending segregation will not go the way you hope it does. Councilmember Rem Lowey made an attempt at culturally appropriating a negative racial stereotype for political purposes. This is grotesque, but it is a distraction from the real debate about the housing crisis. Councilmember Rem Lowey, you're not black. You don't get to use the pain of black people as a shield against accountability. I keep detailed records. You can bet your restaurant any reporter asking me for a quote gets links to screen caps and video clips. No professional reporter is going to commit libel on behalf of a city council member who is trying to distract from the gas they're throwing on the housing crisis. Council member Ramlawi discredits himself in the view of reporters, and this is relevant here because he also discredits the city council when he does this. He isn't the only one. I speak in front of dozens of councils all over. Only in Ann Arbor have council members conspired to get me fired, discredited, silenced, sued, and even arrested. Council member Hayner, I have a veritable buffet of quotes and videos of abhorrent and belligerent behavior of Ann Arbor council members to feed members of the press. I'm not being paid to hold you accountable. It is the right thing to do. I'm not being paid to fight segregation everywhere I find it. I am compelled, and I do it because I'm good at it. Telling reporters I am paid is defamation. Doing it together is civil conspiracy. The Michigan Constitution begins with all political power is inherent in the people. The city of Ann Arbor derives authority from the Michigan Constitution, which in turn is empowered by the Constitution and all Michiganders. You all need to hold yourselves accountable at the level you expect servants of the Constitution like U.S. Senators. When it comes to me, let me make the valuable professional advice extremely clear. When you speak to the press, stick to the issues and keep my name out of your mouths. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else who'd like to speak at public comment? Mary, I don't see any other callers on the line. Thank you. Seeing no one, public comment is closed. Are there communications from council? May I have a motion to adjourn, please? Dr. Bergenthal. I wanted to make a comment about our work on the Gelman cleanup, but I was wondering if you or Council Member Hayner wanted to give more detailed information because I'm neither a lawyer nor do I have all the detailed information that Council Member Hayner has. But if no one else is interested, I will. So, uh, First, I want to thank Congresswoman Debbie Dingell. I know I do that regularly, but uh, most people have no idea how hard and diligently she has worked for many years on this. Um, I think that the best way to sum it up is that we are at a tipping point. We have had over a year of delays, miscommunications, and efforts to exclude the elected officials. And by excluding the elected officials or the interveners, that really silences the voice of the people because we don't just want staff members and appointed officials in Lansing making decisions for us. Today, we had a hearing before Judge Connors. Uh, he denied Gelman's motion to reconsider what that means is we're going to be having a hearing on May 3rd, 4th, and 5th. And he will then, Judge Connors will then make a decision regarding the Gelman cleanup. At the same time, it was made very clear last Thursday night that our request for the EPA is not contingent on any type of litigation settlement or consent judgment in Lansing. Uh, I also want to acknowledge all of the people who are new to the Gelman cleanup because they're making some very naive comments on social media, uh, but I welcome them and I would encourage them to look at previous MLive articles as well as the CARD website. Thanks. Councilmember Song. Hi, I just want to, um, if I can, take a little bit of time and, and recognize that, um, the massacre that happened in the Atlanta area last week and um, how I've been hearing from a number of community members. There's, there's a considerable amount of fear 
and anxiety um, and confusion as to what is happening in our country and this rise in anti-Asian harassment and hate and violence. Um, I know there are local community members who are organizing. I'm trying to help organize some resources, um, but I really encourage folks to report this, reach out to each other. I encourage allies to um, intervene. There's, there's, there are excellent resources on bystander intervention. We need to practice how to um, care for each other. And there'll be a vigil at, on campus for victims of anti-Asian violence um, that's being organized and hosted by U of M students. And that will be at 7 p.m. on the steps of Angel Health. So I, I hope we can, I can see local elected folks um, come and join and give some comfort and support. Thanks. Could you say the day again, Lynn? It's Sorry. this Friday. This it's Friday? This Friday. Okay. Yep. Thank you. For the communication from council. Uh, you know, with um, with Councilmember Song's reference to the uh, the, the murders in, uh, in Atlanta and uh, the, um, you know, the, the 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 terrible and uh, you know just loathsome discrimination, harassment, and violence that uh, uh, people uh, of Asian descent have been experiencing in the country um, for uh, for you know sent, you know. For as long as they've been here, frankly, it's not an accident. It is, of course, um, you know, the result, uh, the ongoing uh, result and expression of uh, of white supremacy. Um, and I know uh, that I, you know, uh, speak for everyone here, uh, or I strive to speak for everyone here at the uh, at the council table in the city uh, when I say that these acts are, you know, profoundly wrong and and deeply unacceptable. Um, uh, Asian people, Asian Americans. Um, you know, in Ann Arbor, um, whether you've been here for generations or whether you showed up yesterday, uh, you know, you are uh, you are part of the community. You belong here. You're in, you are indelible, uh, and you know, you're not a um, you're not merely welcome here. You're a blessing, uh, and uh, Ann Arbor uh, will will stand with you every step of the way um, as a as an entity and for us as individuals. It is our obligation, uh, particularly uh, you know, white people. Uh, when we see uh, uh, when we see discrimination, when we see uh, harassment, uh, that we act as uh, as proper and righteous bystanders. We support the uh, the person uh, receiving the discrimination, the harassment. That we engage them. There are uh, lots of websites at which uh, you can learn uh, bystander trainings. Uh, the Friends Society, highest among them, perhaps. Um, but it is, uh, it, it's our individual and collective duty. Further communication? I have a motion to adjourn, please. Move on. Council Member Hainer, second by Council Member Mlawi. Discussion? All in favor? Opposed? We're adjourned. Thank you, everyone. Mr. Proffitt, thank you. I'm